Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to our new studio. This is our first video in this room. This has been in the works since August, so very happy to finally be filming it here. For this first video here, I wanted to actually go take a peek at some of the comments and answer some of you guys' burning questions, as there's all kinds of fun stuff to read through, so. Let's check out a few comments. All right, first question. Is the best price comparison done via Reverb or somewhere else? I think Reverb is probably currently the most important place to check when looking at what something is worth, what you should buy something for, what you should sell something for, so on and so forth. But the big thing is look at the sold listings. It's really relevant to also see what stuff is currently listed for, but when I'm trying to value a piece of gear, the first thing I usually do is look it up on Reverb, go to solds, and then sort by the most recent so I can see what the asking price was of the most recent solds of that item. I then will look at what the current ones are listed for and see kind of how that compares. Are the current ones listed for more than the ones that sold or vice versa as that all plays into the valuation. I do also like to reference some other resources, so it's always nice to check eBay or what other guitar shops are listing stuff for, if it's a shop that advertises outside of Reverb. Um, and I also like to use the Vintage Guitar Price Guide. I have no association with them, but these books are pretty helpful. It's another good data point. So between the Reverb solds, the Reverb listings, this, and whatever else I find online that I usually give me a pretty good metric of what something is worth and what we will likely sell it for. When you first started out, did you find more success flipping, say, five guitars valued at 400 each or two guitars valued at 1,000 each? To get the ball rolling, do you find the sales velocity or intrinsic value more important? Thanks and love the content. Um, I've been asked variations of this question before, obviously never exactly worded like this, um, but I kind of just started with what I could find and what I could afford. Uh, the first couple guitars I sold were more in that like four or $500 price range, but that also was just stuff that I had that I wasn't using and that's kind of where I got the ball rolling was from selling guitars that I bought for myself, either didn't enjoy them or moved on to something else and then I was selling the old ones and quickly realized, hey, if you buy them right, you could probably sell them for a little bit more than you initially paid for them, which is always great. Um, but I just kind of went off what I found that was a good deal. I wasn't like, oh, I'm only shopping for $1,000 guitars or $400 guitars or $5,000 guitars. It was just like, what was I coming across where there was enough margin to resell the guitar and make some sort of contribution towards the business. So uh, it was really more opportunistic of just kind of whatever I found that I found to be a valuable piece. Maybe the most relevant answer I can give to this is that I was only buying stuff that I wouldn't have minded keeping because I knew it was always a chance that I would end up keeping those first few guitars I bought. Obviously now I don't have to do that. I know that stuff is going to sell eventually. So yeah, I think starting with stuff that you like and stuff that you think will hold value over time is a great place to start investing in guitars if it's something you're doing, but I wouldn't focus on like a specific like price bracket necessarily. Just focus on what you like and kind of go from there. Heavy amplifiers, no matter how good they may sound, are they starting to go out of style? No? I don't think that big amplifiers are really going out of style necessarily. At like any point in time since the 80s, people are always saying like, oh, well, look how digital is now. Now digital is more practical than using tube amps and using heavy amps and cabinets and all that. There's always been some iteration of digital for far longer than I've been alive. Uh, but right now, just as much, if not more than ever, there's so many digital options that, yeah, a lot of people who are touring are definitely gonna gravitate towards more digital options. Doesn't make sense to be lugging around super expensive and heavy tube amp when you can get a really, really close sound with something like, with something like a Kemper, which I am a big proponent of, as much as I absolutely love tube amps and when I have the opportunity to, I love tube amps, but Traveling with a piece of digital gear is much easier than traveling with a tube amp, especially if you're touring internationally. A Kemper, for example, runs on anything from 100 volts to 240 volts, so you can plug it in seamlessly anywhere around the world, whereas your tube amp will probably only run on the voltage of your native country. People are always going to debate if digital or analog is better as far as guitar amps go, and it's really just up to you. They all have their pros and cons. I think there always will be something special to a tube amp and the fact that all of the digital modelers are always chasing tube amps, I think says a lot on its own. But honestly, now with how practical it is to have a Kemper, I do get why it is becoming less and less common to see uh, like mid-tier artists touring with, uh, with non-digital rigs. But people are still buying them. We definitely don't have a problem selling Mesa triple rectifiers or anything like that. So I think the heavy amplifier market is alive and well. 
I do think rightfully so more people now are only buying these amps if it's something really, really good like a Mesa Triple Rec. People aren't buying Marshall MG100 amps or like cheaper solid state options anymore because the digital stuff is just honestly better. So that's really the only shift I've seen is just more of a focus on the higher end stuff and the more accessible heavy amps. Not a huge market for. I will also note that as a shop, I don't really look for these as hardcore as other shops might because we are primarily online and there's a lot of risk and expense and labor and everything that goes into shipping and caring for a tube amp properly. So while I do look for stuff and when the deal makes sense, I still get into tube amplifiers all the time. They are a little bit more difficult to sell than say just like a guitar. Do you have a schedule for future shows? I'm not sure if this is in reference to our future guitar shows that we're doing or just guitar shows in general. There is a guitar show calendar website out there that has pretty much all the shows on it. So if you're just talking about shows in general, check that out. As far as the shows that we are doing, we will be at the Asheville Guitar Show on March 9th and 10th. Next one we will be at is the Nashville Guitar Show, March 23rd and 24th. We will then be at the Dallas Guitar Show from May 3rd to May 5th. I'm very excited for that one. Followed by the Sarasota Guitar Show from May 25th to 26th. And then we'll likely be at the Philly Guitar Show sometime this summer. That's what's coming up for us. These shows aren't confirmed yet, but we're also planning on being at Yokohama Music Sound in Japan on June 29th and 30th. The Mesquite Guitar Show now, instead of the Arlington Guitar Show on October 19th and 20th and the London International Guitar Show on October 27th. Who knows if we will throw some other stops in there, but as of now, that is our itinerary for this year going forward. Oh, this is one of the coolest comments we've had. These next two comments were from our video at the Fender Flagship store. Thanks for visiting the store. We spent a lot of time and effort designing and building the store. Great video and glad you enjoyed it. You definitely understood the sense and sensibility of the store. Edward Bud Cole, president, APAC Fender. So he would be the president for Fender Asia Pacific. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch the video. That's pretty cool. It's definitely cool to see who these videos reach. This is a perfect example of this. Um, so obviously he was heavily involved in the designing of the flagship store. And I guess my predictions on it being kind of themed after like a designer store were confirmed. So you have it right from the source. Thanks again for taking the time to watch. Appreciate you. Hating the silent siren signature is crazy. So this is in reference to a clip from the Tokyo Fender flagship store video where we were looking at some of the Silent Siren guitars, specifically the Silent Siren Telecaster, which has fake F-holes on it. And I think Brian was pointing out that that was just kind of funny that they were fake F-holes and uh, he was roasting a little bit, but those are very, very cool instruments. I love the whole Silent Siren line. We actually brought home a Silent Siren jazz bass. So the Silent Siren line definitely gets a big thumbs up from me and uh, definitely not hating, just having some fun. So these two comments are from the unboxing for palettes of Fender, Gibson, Takai, and more video. And the first one is, I'm interested in that yellow Cyclone. And the other one is, has that US Cyclone sold already? The answer is no, we actually have it right here. Unfortunately, this is not a sales pitch as the neck on this is uh, bowed forward like that. And so, that's what it sounds like right now. It's a pretty bad bow. The truss rod is maxed in that direction and this will need a lot of love to get it playing again. So if anyone can fix this, please get in touch. I know the easiest thing here is probably to just find another cyclone neck, which is extremely difficult. That might be easier than literally fixing this thing. We still have it. If you can fix it, let us know and uh, we'll either give you a good deal on it or potentially send it to you to fix it. A quick question. Would I be in the right assuming you don't have a liking of EVH guitars? I wouldn't say I don't like them, but for me, anything shreddy is not exactly my first pick. I think there's a lot of cool stuff in the EVH line. What I will say is I absolutely love the EVH amps. I used a 50 watt 5150 EL34 edition amplifier for a really long time. It is an amazing sounding head. All the 5153 heads sound really, really good. I have been fortunate enough to get experience with pretty much that whole line and they're always great. So EVH gets a seal of approval from me. Uh, the guitars are not my personal preference, but they're still very well-made guitars. And if you like them, then there you go. Uh, yeah, the EVH signature, the red one with all the stripes and everything for a MIM guitar is price is coming in a little hot. Purchase at your own discretion. It seems like a lot of work went into making that guitar look like that. It's like uh, in Guitar Hero 3, there's a loading screen that says it takes a lot of time to look like you just woke up. That is the guitar equivalent of that. Is that the exact? 
Wow, I've quoted that word for word. All right, I think this is a good question to end on. Shop is great. Alex, what do you think of older guitars with no wear and really clean? Are you weary it's a dud or are there just a lot of not played mid-level guitars? Um, this is an interesting question and I've seen a lot of people have differing opinions on this. In my time dealing in guitars and shopping for guitars, curating this inventory, I have seen a lot. I've seen a lot of vintage stuff in super player condition. I've seen vintage stuff that is unplayable. I've seen vintage stuff that is immaculate. There's a huge range of condition, playability, and everything else out there. So you kind of have to look at this on an instrument to instrument basis. I don't know if this question is looking more so at vintage stuff or if this is looking at newer used guitars. Um, but if we're speaking to vintage, um, there's kind of a common philosophy that if you find a vintage guitar now that's like immaculate, it probably doesn't play well because if it played well, it wouldn't look immaculate anymore because somebody would have been out there enjoying it. And I think there's some truth to that, but I found a lot of closet classic vintage guitars that play really, really well and look nearly untouched. Stuff truly does show up from like under the bed for 50 years. It's out there, it's hard to find. There's definitely examples of stuff where, yeah, it's immaculate, but it doesn't play great, so it doesn't matter. Um, but I think it just differs on a guitar to guitar basis. A very close friend of mine has a 1964 precision bass that was previously owned by his grandpa. And it is not immaculate by any means, but it is in really, really nice shape for what it is. And it plays amazing. It's literally the best playing bass I've ever played. So I think the philosophy there doesn't really count for that. And being that that's my favorite bass, I would kind of discount that, but you know, keep it in mind when you're looking at stuff. So I think that's all the comments we're gonna look at for today. If this is something you enjoyed, please let us know down below in the comments as this is something that we could do again at some point in the future. And in case we do this again, please comment more questions down below on this video or whatever other videos you want to. And if it's something intriguing, then we will make a response for it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. It really does help us out. And we will see you in another video soon. Bye.